Welcome into Phil's Tax Hacks and Other Retirement Facts with CPA and Personal Financial Specialist, Phil Putney. Now let's get rolling with today's show. Hey everybody, welcome back to Phil's Tax Hacks and Other Retirement Facts with Phil Putney and myself. Talking investing, finance, and retirement and some more jargon. This is kind of part two, if you will, of our jargon conversation, financial jargon. Every industry's got it, as Phil and I joked before. The financial industry certainly has no shortage of it. And we're going to talk about understanding the designations and the definitions. So we did a lot of the terms on the prior one that a lot of us kind of see as uh, as regular folks, lay folks, if you will, when we hear these different things. Now we're going to talk about how it relates to finding a professional and the different things that you might hear within you know that side of the equation so that hopefully it kind of all, you know, you find the right fit for you. So Phil, what's going on, my friend? How you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great. So I want to go through a few of the designations and some qualifications and stuff uh, so that if you're, you know, thinking about working with somebody or you're watching a show like ours or listening or whatever, you can kind of say, okay, is this person a talking head? Um, you know, I mean, some of the big ones that are out there, they probably no longer have their designations. They probably no longer actively keep up with their um, you know, whatever their thing might be because they've got this big industry now, you know, so right. it doesn't mean they don't know anything, but just keep that in mind that when yep. you go to actually work with somebody, are the, do they have the proper qualifications for what you need? Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. And it's really understanding, you know, what it means. I mean, to your point, uh, you know, I'm a financial advisor. What does that mean? I mean, it's, yeah. you know, and unfortunately from a, a lay person standpoint, it can be very confusing and I don't want to say deceptive purposely, but I mean, if right. you don't really understand it, you can think you're getting one thing when you're getting something completely yeah. different. Well, so our you regulatory, need to understand what's behind the door, so to speak. Yeah. And our regulatory system, I think just like the IRS making tax codes more complicated sometimes than they need to be. Right. I think right. we, we get lawyers involved and everything just kind of gets so it just gets more convoluted than it maybe really needs to be. So that's kind of the point this week on the show is to kind of address some of this stuff. And, and to your point, you're a CPA as well. And people right. tend to know what that is. They go CPA. I know that that's a tax guy, right? They, we automatically think, well, this is somebody who does tax, right? Right. Um, yep. Financial advisor. Well, okay. Is that an IRA or is that an IAR? That's our first one. What's that? What is the difference in those two things? So, I mean, those are, it really comes back to licensing from that, but an IAR is an advisor, um, an investment advisor representative. So it basically means you're in a representative of a RIA, which is a registered investment advisory firm. You know, so that okay. that's a- One's a person, a firm, one's either, a firm. Yeah, effectively, right. So okay. a, a, an IAR is a, uh, it's not an employee. Generally, they're an independent contractor, if you want to think of that relationship of- a firm, the RIA, and the RIA is going to be either state licensed or could be SEC federally licensed, okay. um, depending generally on size, um, some of it, or even choice. You know, it depends on um, if you're you've got a client across many, many states, sometimes it's easier just to become SEC versus state. So, but generally, yeah, so those are the two at the high level there. The IAR is the person, mm -hmm. RIA is the company. Okay. And it's easy to confuse because they're just one letter and they just move them. Uh, so, okay. exactly. and, then, it's, uh, and then you get the C's. So then we get the C's thrown into the mix. So you've got yeah. chartered, uh, certified, consultant, credited. I mean, so you've got all the, and then you have things like CFP, you know, uh, CFA. Right. Uh, so what are some of this, these kind of things? What's your thoughts there? So these are more, the C's, if you want to think of it that way, these are more designations. You know, okay. some of them are, are licenses like CPA, you know, that um, that is a license. I mean, that's a state license, um, but like CFP, well, that's not really a, a license per se. I mean, it's a designation that's very stringent on, you know, requirements to get it in education, et cetera. So right. it's very similar right. to a licensing. Um, but then CFA, similar chartered financial analysts, CHCF are, are more relating to insurance industries. Okay. Um, but then th this area is where it gets just really like muddy because apart. all of a yeah. sudden there's all these designations that people are coming up with to give, sometimes it's to give themselves letter be letters behind their name. So you've got to be right. really careful and understand and what does it mean? Yeah. yeah. You know, because so most of these in, designations are bought, right? Well, well, I mean, it costs, it costs you to, it costs. It costs, yeah. So, 
some of them, some of them are bought, right? So if mm-hmm. you're just paying to get a designation, those are the ones you got to be really careful on, right? Because there's, exactly. there's no meat or, behind or it's a, it. Or it's a low fee. Behind it. Yes, I say, or it's a low fee and low hanging. Like you can take a test that's like I think of some of the tests I've seen, it's like a ninety percent pass rate because the it's just pretty simple stuff. Right. I mean, it, yeah, it's open book, and you, yeah, so you you pay the fee, you you know, take this quick you test, you know, now test. you're a whatever it is. Yeah, you're whatever um, it is. So your point, like CFP, there's a lot of actually there's you know that one's pretty Absolutely. pretty stringent. There's a lot of work that goes into becoming one, and so it's trying to find out the right fit for you. And and I think that's going to lead me Phil to this next one, and maybe this helps will clarify this because mm-hmm. you do have to have the state and federal licenses to do the proper things, right? So right. these are the series. Uh, so when you're when you're going to work with somebody, an advisor might have something like a series sixty five license or a series right. seven or a series six. So what is that kind of thing? Yeah. So the, the way I guess that to me, you got to think of that this is the license. The license then is going to determine what you can do and somewhat your relationship and res- responsibility with a client. Okay. You know, so um, the security side of licensing can be general security. So that's a series seven, Okay. you know, in stockbroker, if you want to think of it that way, right. Transactional. Okay. So um, they can buy, seven, sell, you can buy and sell stocks. Any, right. any stocks, bonds, mutual funds, anything that's out there available. Right. Okay. So, um, but it's a transactional price, you know, so how you get paid your relationship wow. with the client, it's all based on a transaction. I sell you this, here's a commission. Okay. So that's where the commission side of the, the business usually lives. And if you think of that licensing, their responsibility or their relationship to the client is what's called suitability. Yep. So when I'm, if I'm selling you something, I've got to make sure you're suitable. So I know your risk tolerance. I know your income. I know your assets. Based on all those items, here's something that is suitable for you. It you should know, so work I'm not for selling, you. Yeah. It should work for you. The, yeah. the difference becomes when I'm looking at that, there might be three things that are technically suitable for you, mm. but I don't necessarily have to pick the one that's in your best interest. Any of the three right. will work and it's suitable. So now and, it's and, up and, to that advisor to decide which yeah. one of those really they're going to use, which, and, and this doesn't happen all the time, but just so you know, I mean, they can look at it and say, well, you know what? This company is, they got a trip next year and I really want to try to go to that one. So I'm going to put as many people in that one. It's suitable. Right. It works. Right. But I'm using that one because it pays me better. You yeah. Know, I'm meeting, me, me, I'm me meeting my benefit. obligation, but there's a little something extra in it for me. Right. You know, and there, again, I'm not saying that's wrong. You just right. have to understand that's how that works. Right. Um, okay. On the flip side of that, from a general securities licensing, you've got the 65 and that's where we talked about the IAR, the RAA, that's a licensing for that type of security. So as a, a registered investment advisor mm-hmm. firm under a Series 65 license, IAR of the firm, we can still buy and sell all the same things, for instance, that a Series 7 can. Right. But how we get paid is not based on a commission. So we're not a transactional business. We're not getting incentivized to sell you something new. Right. And that's why, so generally on that series seven side, that's why the, the old broker of, Hey, I've got this, you know, the next great stock. Yeah. When we get the emails of like, I only hear from my guy or gal when they want me to buy something, that's kind of more that side then. Okay. I mean, again, not to say that's what they're doing, but that's how they get paid. Right. Right. Just understand it. Series 65, on the other hand, it's not based on transaction. It's based generally on assets under management. So it's generally a fee based on assets under management. It doesn't have to be. I mean, it could be a fixed fee, but bottom line is it's fee based. You know, gotcha. so there is a specific fee, either fixed or percentage of assets or percentage of assets is the more typical one, but um, you're getting paid based on management of an overall portfolio versus transactional. With that type of a license, then we still have to follow suitability. So, I mean, everyone follows that, but now we have to take it that step further further to be a fiduciary. Yeah. So now when I'm looking at those three options, I have to look at which one best fits your scenario. Yeah, you, it's a, your like a legal and a moral and an ethical responsibility. Well, in, in our industry, just in general, <clears throat> there isn't the trips and the things like that. I mean, that's just not how oh, it works. Sure. We get... Yeah. We get paid based on assets under management or fixed fee. I mean, that's how this industry works. So it's taken away that incentive, if you want to think of it, for us okay. to sell yeah. specific items. I mean, it's really down to 
what's in the best interest for our clients. And, and that's where maybe more of the options. planning comes into place long term versus just a transactional a product kind of thing. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And, and with that, at least personally, I mean, that's the, my approach to it is we always come into it with planning first mm-hmm. because now I know what is going to be in your best interest. I mean, it's, right. I, it's still, you can still get in, in the right direction with what's in the best interest, but to get more specific and have the best of the, what's in the best interest of the client to me, at least you've got to have a plan. Yeah. What are we, what are we trying to accomplish? Now I know exactly what we're trying to do. Now I can look at, here's the options. This is out of those, this is the best one for the client based on whatever it is. And, so. and you can think if you want, want folks, you can kind of think about that a lot of times to me anyway, it kind of breaks down into the accumulation side, working with somebody where you're just accumulating money who might be like that, you know, series seven, that basically that broker who's just helping you the transactional thing. Maybe that's younger and you're growing wealth versus the accumulate or excuse me, versus the preservation side when you get closer to retirement and you're thinking, okay, now I've got all this stuff. How do I hang on to it? I need planning and strategy for the next 30 years when I no longer work. Yeah. I mean, I would say at a high level, that might be a, an easy way to look at it. it. I mean, the, the series 65, that, that side of it still would apply, you know, even if you're younger. Oh, no, true. Um, I'm just g- trying to generally make a, it's, yeah. yeah, it's more, you're going to see more advantage from that side though. I think as you get older and need more, right. Yeah. More service, right? More, it's more complex. It's not just here's a mutual fund, you know, and I'm getting paid a a commission from that mutual fund based on selling you an A share mutual fund. So I get whatever my percentage is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, my job is to try to figure out how to translate it into easy, understandable stuff. Yeah. Sometimes it's yep. hard to do when it gets pretty complicated. So oh, um, I, know, kind of, I know, that's definitely kind of a high level view of it. So what, what does schooling factor into this, Phil? I know the industry's changed so much through the years. Mm-hmm. You didn't used to actually have to go to college or anything to have, and maybe you still don't, to, to be an advisor and have certain designations or certain things. Again, you can, if you pass the licensing tests or whatever, but what does it, right. what kind of role does it play? Well, I mean, so again, this comes back to understanding um, who that person is and, 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 you know, their background, but yeah, I mean, technically education doesn't need to play in. Now, it, if somebody wants to go into financial planning, there are degrees in finance, right? Sure. So, I mean, they, they can take that direction and that better prepares them to, to move in that direction to like a CFP or a CPA or you know, like mine was, mine was in accounting. And, you know, so I took the CPA route. Right. But then from my standpoint, I, I got, and it's not mentioned in here, but what's called a personal financial specialist, which is, which is a designation for CPAs that specialize in financial planning. Gotcha. You know, so it's kind of a next level beyond the CPA to um, let people know, and my education's geared towards financial planning. Right. Um, but for licensing, like to CPA, yeah, there's a very specific educational background you have to go to get that license. Mm-hmm. For a CFP, there's not really, you know, the, depending on your licensing, course. right? You, you're going basically through their course. You don't even, you know, necessarily have to have the education. You can have a, a marketing degree and go get a CFP. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying that that's wrong, you know, right. but just understand um, how this process works. Education is kind of the base, you know. Beyond that, then is really what governs most of it is licensing. You know, that's yeah. what's going to tell you as an advisor and then the individual you're working with, what you can represent and sell to them. You know, right, we you didn't even offer. get into the whole insurance side of the, the world, but insurance is another set of licensing that somebody technically can be insurance only. So they right. don't even have one of these licenses, but they're insurance only. And typically and, Phil, that's the lower hanging fruit where that, that adds yes. that wrinkle too, where you might, somebody might be insurance only and there's some different things like an annuity, for example, or whatever <laughs> different things that they can offer. And they're kind of calling themselves an advisor. And that's, you know, I guess that's where it kind right. of gets. Well, it's, again, it's not, I'm not calling it bad. Just understand what it is. But that's right? all they can do it, legally is insurance. Exactly. They're, yeah. So if somebody is only insurance licensed, the only thing they can sell you is an insurance product. Right. And I'm not saying insurance products are bad. They're, no. We use them. You Just know, know it's, a, right. it's a financial tool. Yeah. But from my standpoint, it's one of the tools in my toolbox that I have right. available to you, me. You it's have the, the uh, only tool. <laughs> yeah. You have all the, the arsenal so, in front of you based on the designations and the education and the things and the licensings that you've done. You have the gamut, whereas some people may right. only have limited you know, ammo. 
in the box. If right. You know. And that's to me where it gets very confusing from a, a, a client standpoint coming in on the outside. You is almost on you to really understand, well, who are you? You know, what are you? What you're licensing to, to know then what are you getting? Right. Because it, it, there, it's not always represented that way. We, we have to do some, dil- some due diligence ourselves. Um, yes. It's an industry where they, I, I think, I don't know if the rules have changed yet again. I know they've kicked it back and forth about testimonials and referrals. That's been no, yep. no for a very long time. Then they said they're going to allow it. Then they said no again. And I don't know if they've decided to allow it or not. But it's one of those kinds of things where, you know, you, you get, hey, who do you use? When you're just talking mm-hmm. with people in general, sure. your friend on the street or whatever, like, well, who do you use? And that, you might get referrals that way. But then at that time, you need us. We need to do our homework. You know, you can go yes. uh, to Fenra org you can go to broker check yeah there's yeah uh websites out there you know fenra state licensing i mean you can look up your state licensing and it'll tell you from a you know insurance license what they have mm-hmm. you know um even like cpa licensing so yeah there's there's a lot of research um that you can do and just ask you know sure. i mean they they they'll they shouldn't be lying or they shouldn't lie to you <laughs> but i mean you know ask don't be afraid and i it, it's become more and more of a common question. You know, I get the question all the time. Well, are you a fiduciary? Yes. And, and in my case, yes, I am actually in, in two roles because as the CPA, hmm. that side, that license carries with it a fiduciary responsibility, but also being series 65 license. Right. And I've got a registered investment advisory firm that I'm an IAR of. Mm-hmm. Well, that side of the, the licensing, so to speak, I'm also a fiduciary. You really want to find the right fit for you. So again, if you're shopping, do a little bit of homework. You can definitely check a lot of things. Check the the alphabet soup at the end of their name, uh, and you know, run that on Broker Check or Fenra or whatever the case is. Ask you know when you go to sit down for a complimentary review, just say, "Hey, are you have that discussion?" Here? Yeah. yeah. You know, what is your, you know, what is your license? How do you get paid? Again, some people get a little whiff. You know, we get a little weird sometimes with that. It's okay to ask because that's it, part of the it, deal. Yeah. And again, on the fiduciary side of it, that's wide open. You know, it, it, I show you exactly this is how it works. I'm not hiding anything. This is exactly how we get paid. Yep. So there's no smoke and mirrors or there's no, you know, this is kind of behind the scenes what happens that you don't really know. This is it. You see, this it. Is it. here it is. There you go. So hopefully that helps you out a little bit. If you got questions and you probably do check out more content, obviously there's other ways to find out more stuff or just reach out to, you know, an advisor or professional and, and ask the questions. As always, you can stop by Phil's website. You can go to philstaxhacks.com. That's philstaxhacks.com. You can call him at 248-888-7530 if you'd like to get on the calendar or just talk with him. 248-888-7530. Or again, just stop by the website, subscribe to us on Apple, Google, Spotify. That links back to his main website. Everything you need right there at philstaxhacks.com. We'll see you next time right here on the program. This has been Phil's Tax Hacks and other retirement facts. Investment advisory services offered through AFS Wealth Management. The content of this program is provided for informational purposes only and is not a solicitation or recommendation of any investment strategy. Investments and or investment strategies involve risk, including the possible loss of principal. There is no assurance that any investment strategy will achieve its objectives.